good evening. Newsletter number 13 is ready, and I'll have more to say about that at the end of the program. But first, I've got something really exciting to show you. The very latest photographs of Halley's Comet, or Hawley's Comet, whichever you call it. Not Halley's Comet, please. That used to be a pop group. Now, these pictures were taken on March the 4th with the big reflector at uh, Pitt Peak in Arizona, the male reflector. And they're rather interesting. Now, this first picture shows the stars as black blobs, and the blob near the center of the picture is a star of magnitude 23, which, believe me, is very faint indeed. The comet is actually close to those two central stars, but in this view, you can't see it. And so there has to be tinkering around with computer processing and electronic devices. And when that is done, the black stars are replaced by white patches, and you can identify them there. We've already got rid of the stars. And then, just near the middle of the picture, you can make out the small black patch that is Hawley's Comet. Still excessively faint and well beyond the range of any but giant telescopes. But of course it is coming in toward the sun all the time. By late 1985 it will come within range of modest telescopes and this is going to be a very important return because as you know various rocket probes are going to be sent uh, by it and even through it. And I assure you we'll keep you posted upon what happens. Well, the sun has come north again. It's passed over the celestial equator and spring has begun. The other day, I projected it with my five-inch telescope and I recorded some sunspots. Not very many, because the sun isn't very active at the present moment. But we must remember that at a distance of 93 million miles, which is not very far, the sun is the only star we can study in detail. Let's consider a star field. Look at this, for example. Now, every speck in that picture is itself a sun. And many of those suns are like our own, and some of them may well have planetary systems around them. We don't know. But, of course, they are a very long way away, and they appear only as points. Now, what we'd like to do is to find out just how those stars are born, how they die, and how they evolve. But that is by no means easy. Also, the stars used to be known as fixed stars, but they're not that. They're moving about in all kinds of directions and all kinds of speeds. And this is why I'm delighted to introduce back from the sky at night, Heather Cooper. Welcome back again, Heather. Thank you. Well, fixed stars are certainly wrong, and I think you'll agree with me that the, uh, the sky is anything but peaceful. Oh, it's churning away like anything. Yes. Stars are being born, they're living and dying. The trouble is they last for such a long time. It's very difficult to follow something that's lasting for 10,000 million years. So we really are in a bit of a problem with our short lifetimes of our own. We are indeed. Now, the only analogy I can think of is to ask what happens if some interplanetary being who doesn't know Earth comes down and spends 10 minutes in a London street, and um, he'll see babies, and uh, boys, and men, and old men. And if he's intelligent, he'll be able to work out that a baby turns into a boy, and a boy turns into a man, because he'll see a human being in different stages of evolution. And mind you, of course, unless he knows uh, the facts of life, he won't know where the baby came from, <laughs> but that's not the point. But he will be able to do it that way. Right, and the point is there are lots of people, so you can piece together the story by seeing lots of people in different stages. And the great thing is there are lots of stars as well, so you can piece together the story of an individual star's life by looking at the different stars in the sky. And let's take tonight's sky, for example, and let's home in on Orion, which is now setting in the west just after sunset, that familiar shape of a giant with his tightly waisted belt, the shoulders made of Betelgeuse and, the, and, Bell and Bellatrix and Rigel down the bottom. Let's close it on his belt and take a look at the sword and the middle star in his sword is where we start because that's not a star at all you can even see with the unaided eye that that's actually a glowing patch of gas and stars are born in clouds of gas which collapse under their own gravity now if you take a look at the Orion Nebula through a pair of binoculars it looks very very beautiful it's glowing it's extremely hot because it's being excited by the light of young stars inside it but it's rather difficult to see those young stars even in pictures taken with say the 200 inch telescope on Mount Palomar there's very little you can see but that glowing gas cloud is about 15 light years across and embedded in the center are the young stars which are actually exciting it to glow as you can see in this picture taken with the Lick telescope here a cluster of star called the trapezium and those actually that's just the beginning because the Orion Nebula is just the front portion of an enormous cloud of gas which covers virtually the whole of Orion and lurking behind the trapezium are some very strange things indeed there are very strange things right inside that nebula I'm thinking particularly of course of BN the Becklin Neugebauer object which is now thought to be a very young very powerful star something like a hundred thousand years old which is not very aged and we'll never see it because its visible light is blocked by the nebular material, but we can detect it in infrared. And here's an infrared picture of it, which is quite interesting. And uh, I just imagine what would happen if we could go there and have a look at the end from close range. Now, here's an impression by Paul Doherty. I wonder whether it would look like that. It could well do. 
But whether that's correct or not, one thing is absolutely definite. The Orion Nebula and other nebulae like it are stellar birthplaces. The stories of the stars begin there and generally they begin in clusters. That's right, because there's so much gas around in space that when it collapses, it doesn't just form one star, it forms whole clusters of them. And they're born a bit like a, a clutch of eggs in a nest, very appropriate for spring. And as the stars grow up and as they get, get their energy together, as it were, they give out powerful radiation and stellar winds. And you can see in this picture the Rosette Nebula, which is not too far from Orion, a clutch of young stars right in the centre, surrounded by the gas which hasn't actually formed into stars and it actually won't because the young stars are now emitting energy so powerfully they're driving the gas away. So what you actually have is a cluster of stars which form out of the gas. The stellar winds then start to blow the remaining gas away. It may well form into stars next time round but for the moment what you're left with is just a cluster of stars swept clean of gas. And of course there are plenty of those clusters around. The most famous of all is the, uh, the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. Not well seen now, I'm afraid, but you'll see it again in the autumn. And uh, that really is beautiful, even with the naked eye. This picture taken through a big telescope shows a certain amount of nebulosity, but the main nebulosity is gone. And then there's an entirely different kind of cluster, Trisepi or the Beehive. And that's on view now. And you can find it almost directly between Regulus in Leo the Lion and Castor and Pollux in Gemini. And you can see it quite clearly with the naked eye on a moonless night. Binoculars show it well and through a telescope, plenty of stars are seen. Obviously, it's nothing like so rich of the Pleiades. You haven't got the nebulosity there, and quite obviously, Pisipi is an older cluster. It's considerably older. The Pleiades are thought to be about 60 million years old, which is pretty old as far as we're concerned, but Pisipi is probably about 400 million years old. What I like about Pisipi is the name, and if my Latin stands up to it, I think it means the manger. Mm -hmm. People call it the beehive as well, because it looks like a swarm of bees, but the Chinese had a delightful name for it in ancient China, and they called it the exhalation from piled up corpses. Mm, thank you very much. I think, I think I'll stick to the beehive. <laughs> and now it's a fascinating cluster and well worth looking at. So we've got condensed clusters and then more open clusters such as Pisipi. And then of course we get to the stage where the stars on a cluster become so scattered that they are difficult to recognize as a cluster and they then turn into what we call stellar associations. And that's because they're associated with each other gravitationally. They're still feeling each other's pull slightly. But because they're moving around the galaxy and they feel the pull of other stars outside, they do tend to split up a bit. And there's one association you can see every night of the year and that's the five stars in the middle of the plow and the five stars in the middle of the plow are all moving together through space in the same direction the odd ones out are the two stars at the end which actually have their own paths because they're not part of the association and as you see in years to come and this is speeded up by the way to represent about a hundred thousand years in a few seconds you can actually see the familiar shape of the plow will indeed change as the five stars move together and the two outer stars don't yeah, another demonstration that our constellations are anything but permanent. Absolutely. And then, of course, we've got to remember, too, that our sun may be rather unusual. It's a single star, mm. and many stars are double. There's a perfect example of that in the, in, in the Great Bear of the Plough. Mizar, the second star on the Plough's handle, well, that has a naked eye companion, Algor, Alcor, and through a telescope, Mizar itself has seemed to be double. Right. The point is, with double stars, they're a legacy of the fact that stars were born together in clusters, and usually before the cluster itself breaks up, stars hang on to a companion, you know, sharpish-like. Mm. But our sun seems to have drifted apart on its own. But yes, most stars indeed are double, and uh, Mizar is one. In fact, it's a very, very complicated one. I think the best one of the whole lot, though, is Castor in the constellation of Gemini. Yes, the, the, the senior but fainter member of the twins, the upper one of the two. White, well, as Pollux is decidedly orange, and that really is a whole family party. You can't see it in this photograph, unfortunately, but it's a beautiful picture shown in the middle of the Milky Way just there. You can just about see with a telescope that Castor is actually double what you can't see. In fact, that it's a, a sextuple star. It's got six different components all going around each other. Um, and I'd love to go if there was a planet actually going around these stars. Just imagine what the sky would look like. It would be an incredible sight. Uh, two brilliant pairs of white stars and one pair of faint red stars. Well, I think a planet there would have a rather uncomfortable kind of climate. And not much sleep if you live there either. Well, we've uh, taken the story some way. All these stars we're talking about now are hot and energetic. Because they're using up fuel, which is mainly hydrogen, and that fuel is not going to last indefinitely. So a star is going to change when it starts to run short of fuel. And that's the next stage in the story. That's right. Now, stars are a bit like hydrogen bombs, but they're so big and they're so massive, they don't actually blow up. And gradually, they do run out of fuel. They can only process that fuel very, very deep inside them, where the temperatures and pressures are very, very high. But there comes a stage, as you say, when they run out of fuel. And oddly enough, when a star runs runs out of fuel, it swells up and becomes much cooler and therefore redder and it turns into a red giant. Such as Betelgeuse and Orion is now. That's right. 
interesting picture of Betelgeuse here, taken with a very complicated electronic device, and it was thought that those represented star spots, although I gather there's a certain amount of doubt about that now. Well, it's called an artifact in the processing, I think, but that actually is a picture of the disc of Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse, as I prefer to call it, <laughs> and that's an amazing thing, because Betelgeuse is so enormous, it means you can actually, with special techniques, take a photograph of the star's surface. Um, but it is very, very huge indeed. Well, the diameter is over 200 million miles, and that is greater than the path of the Earth around the Sun, so it really is huge. And of course, it's variable in size, because, as you say, its atmosphere is billowing in and out like a balloon, and eventually it's going to lose it. That's right. But, of course, the way it got there is very interesting. It's not certain how, but the, the best buy model at the moment is that when Betelgeuse ran out of fuel, its centre collapsed in on itself, and when you collapse gas, you actually compress it and make it hotter. And as the core heats up, and, of course, it's a dead core, it can't actually as any more fuel, it heats up the layers of the star further out, and that in turn causes a shell of burning, it's a, a hydrogen to helium burning, and the outer layers just billow out in this kind of red giant shape, so it really is an enormous thing. And as you say, they don't last forever, it seems that after all this wobbling about like a celestial blancmange, Betelgeuse will eventually jettison those layers into space. It'll then turn into what we call a planetary nebula. The remnant of the old star will still be there, very small, very dense and very hot, and the atmosphere thrown off will be show up as a, as a ring, giving rise to the name planetary nebula, and there's a very good example of a planetary nebula on view now. It's in the constellation of Lyra, the Lyre, not very far away from the brilliant blue Vega, which is pretty nearly overhead, and of course one of those stars where the infrared astronomical satellite detected what may be a planet-forming material. Yes. But um, look close to Vega and you'll see the two third magnitude stars, Beta and Gamma Lyrae. Beta, by the way, is a famous eclipsing variable. We must do a program about that sometime. You're on. And uh, M57, this, um, this planetary nebula, is directly between the two. You won't see it with the naked eye or binoculars. You will see it with a small telescope, but I'm afraid you won't see the brilliant colours shown here in this photograph taken with the Palomar reflector. And uh, you'll be hard put to it to see the central star, which is the remnant of the old red supergiant. That other star, near the edge of the nebula, is not nothing to do with it, really, and that merely lies in the foreground. But the ring nebula is only one of quite a number of planetaries. It's expanding, of course, and over a few thousand years it'll cease to shine. Of course, if you do have a telescope, a medium-sized telescope, there are other planetaries on view, and one of the ones I like is the Owl Nebula, which is in the constellation of Ursa Major, and there you see its big eyes looking out at you. Yes. Then there's the Helix Nebula. That really is beautiful. Mm. Again, colours aren't real. It looks as if it's moving at a fantastic velocity there, but actually it's not. It's just like puffing off a smoke ring. And then finally, of course, there's the Dumbbell Nebula in Vulpecula the Fox. A rather strange shape, that one, but once again, right in the centre, you can see that compressed remnant of what used to be the centre of the old star. Well, the centres of these old stars lose their gaseous surrounds, the planetary nebulae vanish, and we're left with the old stars themselves. And that comes right on to the idea of a white dwarf star. That's right. Now, these stars are actually the compressed remnants of the old star. They're the central core, and they are just so collapsed in on themselves that if you went there with your trusty teaspoon and picked up one teaspoonful, the matter's so compressed it would weigh a tonne, which is quite incredible. So these stars really have collapsed in on themselves. Well, the most famous of all the white dwarf stars, undoubtedly, is um, the companion of Sirius. Mm. Now, there's a photograph of Sirius. Those spikes are, of course, photographic effects. Sirius, I'm afraid, is set now. You won't see it again until the end of the year. And just below the main star, you can see a little blob, which is the companion, Sirius B, often known as the pup star, because Sirius is the dog star. Interesting thing being that although Sirius has only two and a half times the mass of the sun, the pup is as massive as the sun. And about the size of the Earth, by the way, so you can try and imagine how, how compressed that would be. And that's very, very nearly the end of a star like the Sun, because the white dwarf has got no fuel left, and all it can do is just sit there and leak away its heat into space, and eventually it'll end up as a cold black globe. Well, that's the eventual fate of the Sun, although I'm afraid that the Earth won't be there because the Earth can hardly survive the red giant stage. Oh, but there's no panic because it's not going to happen for 5,000 million years. Quite some time ago. Right. But let's now look at the stars which die in a very much more violent way. The more massive stars, which explode as supernovae. Uh, we haven't seen a supernova in our galaxy since 1604. We're overdue for one, I think. We are. But let's have a look at a photograph of a supernova in an external galaxy, millions of light years away. There it is. It's an ordinary spiral. And there, on the end of the arrow, you can see what is a supernova. A tremendous stellar outburst when a star blows itself to pieces and its peak shines something like 15 million times as brilliantly as the sun. That's right, and when they do this, they fling out their matter into space and virtually nothing is left at all. 
But in fact, we have seen supernova in our galaxy, and we can see the relics of those supernova around today. And one of the most famous ones, of course, is the Crab Nebula, which was seen to explode by the Chinese astronomers in the year 1054, who said, look, there is a great bamboo mat up there in the sky. <laughs> well, of course, that's what we see today, 10 light years across and still expanding. Right at the centre of that, by the way, is a kind of super-collapsed white dwarf, which is called a pulsar, a rotating neutron star. A, uh, a pinhead full of matter, in this case, would weigh about a million tonnes. So we really are dealing with super-compressedness here. And, of course, there are other supernova remnants. That lovely photograph of the Vela super remnant in the, uh, uh, in the southern hemisphere, taken by David Malin over the Anglo-Australian telescope. Look at those wonderful filaments. And the lovely thing about those filaments, I think it shows very graphically that that is going to form into stars next time around. Because the whole point about stars being born and living and dying is that it's all part of a cycle. When stars die, they give out matter which then is used up in the next generation of stars. When stars are living even, they're giving out energy all the time, they're giving out material. When a star gives out matter as a planetary nebula, that's still stuff for the next generation of stars to be born. And just in case we want proof of that, let's take a look once again, let's come right full circle and look at the Orion region again. And when you see Orion in the sky, just as a collection of stars, it's very pretty, but that's all you see. Now let's take a look with the infrared eye of the RAS satellite, and you can see the whole of Orion, and you can pick out his belt in the middle of the screen there, is actually covered in cool gas. And that cool gas is poised to form the next generation of stars. Now, let's try and sum up what we've been saying by showing a chart which will really give the idea of how a star is born, how it evolves, and how it dies, bearing in mind that a, a star like the Sun will die in a different way from a much more massive star. Well, we start off in every single case with a cloud of gas collapsing under gravity, dark gas which begins to glow because it's illuminated by the light of young stars which are being formed by collapse inside. Eventually, there's a very, very bright glow, and the stars themselves then start to disperse the gas with their stellar winds. And what you're left with is a cluster of stars, which then begins to expand. And here will follow the careers of two stars in the cluster, a massive white supergiant and an ordinary yellow star like the Sun. Which, of course, have very different life stories. That and bearing in mind also that the more massive star goes to its career very much more quickly. And it's ending now. In fact, as you can see on the screen, it becomes a red giant very quickly, and then it explodes as a supernova. And depending on what's left from that explosion, you can have two ultimate fates. It can become a pulsar, as in the Crab Nebula, or it can become a black hole. You know, Heather, I knew we couldn't do a programme together without mentioning black holes somewhere. <laughs> I knew I'd get them in soon. Uh, quickly, our, our other star evolves more slowly, becomes red giant, puffs off its outer layers gently as a planetary nebula, leaves a white dwarf, which then cools, becomes red, ends up as a dead black globe. We've got to bear in mind that the universe is very old, something like 15,000 million years is a pretty good guess. And there have been several generations of stars. So this cycle has been repeated time and time again. And our sun is not a first generation star. So in point of fact, the material making up the sun uh, has already been uh, contained in previous stars that have long since died. And that also goes for all the rest of our own solar system. Including the Earth. Including the Earth and including you and me. And uh, what I think is so fascinating is that there's no doubt at all that the material making up you and me and everything in the Earth and everything in the solar system was once contained inside a massive star which has long since come to the end of its life and has blown itself to pieces. So you were once part of a star. And so were you. <laughs> Perfectly true. And it's really rather a sobering thought. And this cycle is going to continue for a very, very long time. Whether the universe will ever die, we don't know. But not for a long time yet. There will be many more generations of stars. And uh, there will be stars long after our sun and our Earth have disappeared. So it's a sobering thought. Finally, newsletter number 13. As I said, that is now ready. And if you would like it, then uh, please send the stamped address envelope as usual to newsletter number 13, The Sky at Night, BBC Television, London, W12, 8QT. And from Heather and myself, good night. <laughs>